All right, guys, welcome to the show. It's Robbie here. Another episode of SideQuest Podcast, the unofficial podcast of Fitocracy. If you have not gone to iTunes and hit the subscribe button and left us a review, as soon as you get done listening to this episode, I would greatly appreciate you going over there. Just type it in, great show, love the guests, hit enter, submit, and then hit subscribe. Helps us move up the charts so more people can hear all the great guests that we have going on here. If you want to start following us on Twitter, check us out at SideQuestFM. Also on Instagram at SideQuestFM. Also, you can check out our webpage at www.sidequestpodcast.com. All the interviews go up there as well as the blog and some fun stuff as well. And you can also check us out on Facebook, SideQuest Podcast. Side quest podcast. You can like us there, uh, chat with us, leave me a message, let me know what you think. Uh, and we're, we're growing there slowly but surely. I have a great guest for you today. Uh, he is a trainer in New York City, uh, does lots of great writing out there, uh, and I consider him a friend. He is the man who got me into the best shape of my life for my wedding a few months ago. Uh, the one and the only Mike Vacanti. Mike, welcome to the show. What's up, man? Thanks for having me. Ah, uh, no problem, no problem. Um, so many people have probably heard me mention your name a few times uh, in, in a couple different episodes. Uh, you were the man who, who ran the uh, uh, Romans uh, 16 Weeks to Sectionist program, which got me me ready for the wedding uh, and into to the great shape that I was in. Uh, Scotland then destroyed all of that great shape. Has, <laughs> is the greatest thing ever invented. Um, it's like sausage, but better. Um, but, uh, anyways, so, uh, I just wanted to, to, to get you on the show cause you were voted one of the top five people in the fitness industry, taking the uh, industry by storm by fitocracy. So my goal is to get all five. I've had, uh, you on the show. I've had knuckles. I've had, uh, Adam, uh, and I got two more that I'm working on. They'll be on soon. Um, so I want to, you know, thank you for coming on, but for those who may not know who Mike McCanty is, who is Mike McCanty and how did you get to New York city? Uh, and become a trainer. Um, so again, super pumped to be here. And you were like, I remember during the 16 weeks, the four months of coaching, the video updates that you would do <laughs> just, like, injected life into the group. Um, <laughs> like a lot of online coaching is via text, whether it's email or on the photography platform, which is amazing. Um, and there's a lot of communication from the coaches via video, but not as much from the clients. And right. you would submit these like three to five minute videos that were just amazing. Made my week every time. Um, <laughs> is that a big deadlift? Uh, okay. So I, I had to give you a little credit there. Who am I? Um, I came out to, I moved out to New York city after quitting my accounting job in 2012. So I'm, I'm a CPA. I worked two years at a big firm out of college in Minnesota, hated my job. I quit without any real plan of what I was going to do. Um, not really knowing that like, like online coaching was a thing or that fitness blogs were a, a way for someone to sustain a living or had the kind of reach and can help as many people as you can online. I just quit because I hated accounting so much. <laughs> I moved around, played poker for money at the time, like I did in college, um, spent some time in Vancouver, a couple cities in the U.S., and then when John Romanello posted an opportunity for an internship in New York City, like, had to be local, have to be like in a certain age range, passionate about fitness. Basically, he wanted someone that he could groom in, in his footsteps who wanted to, who could help him, but then do what he was doing which is exactly what I wanted. So I abused him on all fronts, like Facebook, emailing, I hit up his assistant and I ended up getting an interview the next day, booked a one-way ticket that afternoon to New York. Um, and, and I've been here since. That's uh, that's, that's ballsy. A one-way ticket with no, so what, what, what would have happened? What would you have done if, if you'd got, 
to that Starbucks. I'm assuming it was probably at a Starbucks because everyone in New York City, if it's not in an office, you're going to interview in a Starbucks. Um, it was in a Starbucks. You're, you're absolutely correct. <laughs> well, when I sold stuff on Craigslist, I was like, what's the safest place to meet people at? Starbucks. <laughs> <laughs> um, so what would you have done if he had been like, you know, uh, I don't think this fit is right for you. Were you? Would you have just been like, you know what, screw it, I'm going to stay in New York City and just and, and grind it and, and make a living, or would you have gone back to Minnesota? You know, I never thought about this until probably a year after when I was asked the question. Um, but the what if really never entered my mind. And now, in in hindsight, I can answer it, and I would have, I wouldn't have stayed out here. I would have moved back. Um, and I had, I had started my blog about a month prior, so I think I would have been writing and, and still trying to um, grind to build a following, to acquire clients in person, um, to, to put out content that help people. But working under Roman expedited my, like the learning curve so much that I, I'm 100% sure that I wouldn't even be like 10% of where I am now had that not panned out. And yeah, luckily uh, it, it went well at that Lower West Side Starbucks at 8 a.m. back uh, like a, a year and a half ago. So super grateful. Yeah, well, I mean, I, you know, I, I struggled with uh, the idea of moving to New York before before I did, before, you know, uh, my then girlfriend, now wife, both of us decided, uh, ah, small town, let's, let's do it. We got theater degrees. So let's like actually pursue New York. And I, and I, I thought about LA and then I thought about New York and, and, uh, and I had that thought where I was like, you know what, just, just, just do it. You know, like you got a little bit of money, just, just go. Even if, if you grind it out and you end up being broke and poor, like 90% of the people, you know, in <laughs> New York city, um, and you got to come home. At least you did it. At least you tried. Um, and I survived two years before my poor country boy heart was like, I can't, I need trees and fresh air and ability to get out. And it just, it, it that is, I miss that so much, like just space and room to move. I don't, I don't think people realize like so many people like here in, in Richmond are like, Oh, New York city. It's so beautiful. I love it. I, w I wish I could live there. And I want to say to them, you know, it's the saying is it's a great place to live. It's a shitty place to survive yeah. because it's just, it's so hard. Everything is so much more expensive and, and you got to be on the train at the, at the worst times or the best times. And it just, it, it drains you and it, it will, it will break you if you let it break you, but it, it can be beautiful at the same time. But Central Park is so nice, but at times you kind of realize that you're boxed in by these skyscrapers. And I'm like, but I want to get out where there's mountains and, and I can just see mountains. And for me, that's, I, you know, I, I felt trapped and, and much like, like the city rats. I was like, I got to get out. I got to get out. <laughs> I, I completely understand. Every time I, I visit my family back in Minnesota, I appreciate the open roads and ability to drive and just the air feels cleaner. Um, it is. It's it's a super big and busy city that has a ton of upside, but can yeah. also wear you down over time. Yeah, yeah, and that's I do I do miss aspects of it, and there are other things I do. Uh, I man, the things I do I do miss are like you know what? It's nine o'clock. I wish I had someone who could deliver me food that's not. Domino's. Oh wait, I'm in New York City. I can totally have anyone deliver me anything. Seamless, absolutely. <laughs> they don't. I don't even think Seamless exists where I am. Uh, yeah. Uh, all right. So I got a, I got a couple questions for you from your writing. Um, because I I I love everything that that you write. I think there's a lot. You didn't have to I, say that. Uh, no. I, I mean, you know, everyone I've read so far. It, my, my wife told me the other day as I read, uh, I was asked to be best man in a wedding a couple weeks ago, and uh, I read her the, uh, the toast that I gave, and she was like, you know, you're a really good writer. And I'm like, really? Because I feel like when I write blog posts for the website, I feel like I just sound like an eight-year-old who's trying to write, like, Shakespearean poetry to the girl he's in love with. And I just, it sounds awful. And uh, so I, I enjoy stuff when I, when I read it and it makes sense and it kind of uh, hits me in, in the right place. 
Um, and a lot of your stuff does that because I was reading through stuff last night and I'm like, man, this guy hated his job. Like I hate my, maybe I should just, maybe I should just man up. And you had a, you had a thing where it said, you're only as much of a man as the decisions that you make or the risks that you take. Um, and that's, that's sitting on the back burner and has been for the last 24 hours, kind of, kind of, uh, simmering there in my mind. Uh, but one of the ones that I really loved was you talked about Arnold's six rules and you posted that video and this is from a 2009 commencement speech that he did at USC. Mm -hmm. um, and I'll post this in, in the show notes for everyone, because I, I honestly believe this is one of those things that you have to see. Um, and Arnold does a great job of like living up to the persona that he kind of has of like, the, uh, get to the chopper. And everyone is like, oh, we love Arnold. But he is one of the most intelligent and well-spoken individuals that I have like ever listened to. Absolutely. Um, well, and the, and they cut up the speech, which was twenty minutes or, or something. In yeah, yeah. the video, you add music, like a, a movie score, Hans Zimmer time, or whatever they throw, <laughs> in. and it's just like you, you're just so amped up to do whatever you're about to do, whether it's go deadlift or like tell your boss to fuck off or, or anything. <laughs> well, I enjoy these six rules because I'm listening to them and I'm like, man, these. Like, this is just like, this should be common sense to everyone. And the six rules are, one, trust yourself. Two, break the rules. Three, don't be afraid to fail. Four, ignore the naysayers. Five, work like hell. And six, give something back. And mm -hmm. everything I read, you know, in your numerous posts, kind of touch on at least some aspect of those six rules. So which one of those rules do you believe is the most important to you that you strive to apply to your daily life? Oh, the, the, so they're all really good, obviously. And I think a couple are, are more applicable than others. But the first one, trust yourself, is what I have found to be the most important or I saw the greatest change from following that I was the most scared to do, which is – we all have a voice in our head, like this, this little voice that tells us things. We talk to ourselves and a lot of people ignore that voice um, because like they're afraid, which isn't anything to be embarrassed about. I'm afraid of a ton of things like fear of failure, fear of judgment, fear of what are other people going to think if I take X, Y, Z unconventional route or I try something new. But if you have a strong intuition and you feel in your gut, in your head that you're supposed to be doing something, Trusting that small little spark of a feeling and going with it is what has created um, like the, the best and happiest and moments and things in my life that I'm the most proud of. So option one, I, like work like hell is a gift in anything. The harder you work, the more, the better results you're going to see. Um, and then number six to giving back, like the satisfaction and just sense of good and right that I get at least when I when I do charitable type work or just like compliment someone or say something nice to someone in, in everyday life like that feels good the idea of trusting ourselves I guess that I feel like this year my wife and I were talking about this last night I feel like 2014 has been like a very introspective year for me and i know that like yes i got married and i don't want to sound like i'm the typical guy who's like oh god i'm getting married i have to rethink my entire life but it happened like it kind of does because society says that you're supposed to do this certain thing and you're supposed to feel this certain way and you know now you're getting married and you know i grew up in a in a very conservative southern household where the man provides and he he does right by his woman and and all the the, the things that I feel like America and our generation is kind of fighting against or trying to at least mold into our own meaning. Um, so I think trusting yourself is something that's really hard to do and it's hard for anyone to do and make that decision, especially when it comes to like, I want to get in shape. I, I want to get out of debt. I want to do something better. I want to, I want to pursue my dream. Um, is there like, do you still struggle with trusting yourself or does it get easier each time that you kind of trust yourself more? Hmm. Um, it, it definitely gets easier, but I absolutely, it's something that's still at the forefront of my mind and something that I have to 
force myself to do um, every single time. It's like there aren't – I'm trying to think of a, a specific example, and I'm not coming up with anything. Um, but like taking on new – like like taking on Gary as a, as a client – who is uh, someone who I train in the gym every single day. He's my one client in the gym. And I travel with him. I am in his office where he runs his 400-person agency in New York City, like cooking his lunch and then giving it to him and making sure he eats it every day and making <laughs> sure that protein, fat, and carbs are on point for the training day. And, like, boom, just literally I am his right hand. I'm his the CEO of his body is what I think. <laughs> um, but I was, I was really afraid to take that on because I was scared to spend six hours a day in an office setting. Um, and I was scared that, that like just listening to myself rather than thinking of external opinions or what other people think of, making a decision still impacts a lot of my choices. Yes. Okay. Okay. I, is it, is it weird now that you're kind of like back in an office situation? You're like, wait a minute, I quit this like three years ago. What am I doing? So there's, there's actually not much of that, which I'm super lucky about one. Um, it's so low key, like it's so casual and, and an accounting firm that has like, you're on site with the clients a lot versus a creative agency that does social media marketing for companies under a guy who runs a company with an amazing corporate culture. Like I wear sweatpants and trainer stuff to, to the office. And I'm known as like, Oh yeah, Gary's trainer guy who like gives him food. That's really weird. Why is he here? Like I'm, I'm not in the office politics or like the, the hierarchy or anything like that. So no, it's, it's not weird. It's actually fun for me, but I was afraid that it, it might be. Okay. Okay. Um, so I did have a couple of questions on Gary and if uh, for listeners that don't know, Gary is, is, is Gary. I'm not going to pronounce his last name cause I would probably screw it up. Uh, Vaynerchuk. Vaynerchuk. Um, I, I like how he pronounces it on his show. Um, and I'm like, Oh, that's a great way to like, you break it up. It does make, it does <laughs> kind of make sense. Um, Vaynerchuk. But, <laughs> so so Gary V is is if anyone out there who's not watched a YouTube video from this guy, he may be one of the most intense and like inspiring people that like you could ever watch. He just the, the fire that burns in him and just the, the flames that come out of his mouth and the energy that he has is is mind blowing. Um so I was thinking about that and and you you wrote a post about how you know you had trained him for a while and then he came up with this idea of Mike we're going to do something every day doesn't matter what it is we're going to do something every day. Um and a lot of the people that I've talked to lately on the show you know talk about falling in love with the process. Mm -hmm. And you know as I feel like that's something a lot of people may not understand and doesn't make a lot of sense to people but from an artist standpoint and from my background as 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 a theater major and, and having a degree in that is you always you go to the movies you go to the theater you see the final product mm -hmm. and, and for all of us we're all like i want to be tom hanks and i want to give that performance but you don't realize that the most you learn about yourself and your talent is through the process and the the rehearsal and the games that you play and the things you got to do to get there is really where you learn as an artist and that's where you shine not once the lights come on stage but yep. what you've done in the process yep, yep. so gary's has been you know a, a a big thing for you there was some failure now there's some successes so what have you learned from observing gary's process that you may not have learned from your other clients uh, or from your own process that you now kind of realize and, and want to apply to the future um Hmm. So one thing that I, that, that's hard to apply for a client unless you know them really well, um, is setting up a program that actually truly fits their lifestyle. So that can be anything from training frequency to the length of training sessions, to the type of training um, to whether or not you have cheat days, whether you do two cheat meals a week or one huge blown out cheat day once every other week. 
Um, whether you should weigh in every morning, whether you should weigh in once a week, whether you shouldn't step on the scale because it's going to screw you up mentally every single time. Like all, we are all so very different and how I, like, I knew this, but what opened my eyes to it through Gary V was the way we set up. So for the first 60 days, um, or maybe it was 90 days, two, two to three months, he, he dropped a lot of body fat. He was what I would call skinny fat around five, eight in the one eighties, mid one eighties, um, and not a lot of lean mass. And so we started lifting, had him in a deficit, high protein, and he, he ended up in the low one sixties, which was probably five to six pounds of glycogen, carb storage, water weight. Um, but a solid 12 to 15 pounds of fat loss. And at that point, it was kind of like, okay, now we want to add muscle, but we want to do it in a way where you're not adding body fat as well. Let's do a form of recomp where we'll have certain days where you're in a surplus and you're training hard and other days you're in a deficit. And I just threw Monday, Wednesday, Friday at him because that makes sense, right? Like that's a good three days a week. We'll eat big Monday, Wednesday, Friday, keep it light on the weekends and Tuesday, Thursday. Well, Gary, Gary literally wakes up at 6 a.m. every single day. We work out or bike or stretch or do yoga or something. And from 7.30 a.m. after he gets out of the shower until 11 or 12 or 1 o'clock, he's working. Like his calendar is blocked off in 15-minute increments all day with running his agency, his investments, his he's meeting with people constantly. He has a dinner or two dinners every night, drinks from 9 to 10, 10 to 11, 11 to 12. And so on a weekday, he doesn't want to eat a 500 calorie surplus. Like he can't even get that down. He's too busy. He's too on his grind. He's just like food. I don't want to think about food. Don't bring me food. I'm, I'm busy. Whereas on the weekend when I was trying to limit him to, I don't know, 1400 calories or whatever it was on that day and super high protein, like eat lots of veggies, don't snack on anything, keep it really on point. The weekends are his time to relax. So he's with his kids. He's with his wife. He's, he's with his, his family, um, parents or whatever. And he wants to snack and enjoy and relax. So after a couple of weeks of why isn't this working, I realized, well, let's train Wednesday, Saturday, Sunday. So he can eat a lot on those days when he's relaxing and then keep calories super low during the week when he's just on his grind. So that was a super easy change that I could make that I'm not a hundred percent sure I would have recognized in another client um, had, had I not had my finger to the pulse like I do with Gary. Okay. All right. Um, so I, I got to ask because you mentioned it in a, in a blog post that, uh, that he, he said, you know, Mike, you're, you're missing a great opportunity here. Um, so when's the book coming? <laughs> I, I, I know you're keeping the data. I, I know that, that, that stung you and, and you wrote a post about he's right. I, I should be. So when are, when are we getting the New York times bestselling author, Mike McCanty book? <laughs> um, if, if it happens, not, not anytime soon, <laughs> I, I, gave, I gave Gary a two year commitment. We're six months in and, um, I would be lying to you and to anyone who's listening if I said that that is not on my mind and something that um, I'm not hungry for because I am. And after he said that, I went back and I spent like, it was like a cross country flight. So six hours just over caffeinated and going back through the schedule and the workout schedule. And I wrote, it was like 7,000 words or something. Um, 9,000, I don't remember, but just <laughs> recapping everything and every story I could remember and just getting it all down. And now after every workout, I'm taking notes. Um, if, if this two year experience turns into something or all of this writing I'm doing ends up being something that I think is valuable enough that it could be a book or that people would want to read it, that people would benefit enough from it, that it makes sense. Then 2016 is mine. <laughs> All right. All right. I'll, uh, I'll keep an eye out for, for 2016 and uh, make sure I 
if the podcast is still going, that uh, when you do release the book, we get you on here as, as part of a launch party. <laughs> um, so speaking of books, so what book from, from this year, from 2014, would you give to all of your friends and family if you could do it for Christmas? So like right now, right um, now, like if let's say you were like, oh, man, I don't know what to get anyone, but you wanted to give out one book that meant a lot to you this year. What what would that book be? I love that you said from 2014, because it like it forces me to come up with a new answer every year. I can't just give my my <laughs> book that that I do give. Um Gosh, I really I'm gonna grab it because I'm so close and I don't want to butcher the author's name too. Just kind of okay. Like, so it's called Live Your Truth by Kamal Ravikant. Ravikant, Ravikant. Um, who's like I heard about him through James Altucher, and I think he's buddies with Tim Ferriss, and um so through through one of those guys, I, I heard of this. But it's 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 actually it's a super short read like a hundred pages, big, big font. Um, and it's written in a way that's very simple. Um, it goes in line with the Arnold quote a lot. Trust yourself when you are putting your most honest and true self out to the world, that is when you're going to be the happiest. That is when you are going to be I don't want to say the most comfortable because often it's not comfortable. Um, like successful and not in the terms of like money or power or fame or anything like that, but successful in that your the way you act is aligned with who you are and what you truly believe. Um, and I just remember reading it in, in a couple hours, and I'm a slow reader, maybe two hours, and being really moved by it. So that... You know, maybe I will give a few copies of that out now that I, I said that. Okay. So you, you said there's one that you normally give out. What's the one that you normally give out? It, it's not 2014, so I, I don't even want to give it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> that, that one's called Your Best Year Yet, which is like a super self-helpy fill out the – like fill in the blanks while you're going with a pen type book that the, the point of it is to make your next year your best year. And in the time after I quit my accounting job, I was I had moved back home with my parents at age 24, and I was there for like a few weeks, three or four weeks. And I was very nervous and anxious, and I didn't know what I wanted or what I wanted to do. It was the first time in my life I struggled with anxiety, and I read that book. And three days later, I was on a one-way plane out to Vancouver to play poker on the internet because it wasn't legal in the U S at the time. Oh, don't was, even get me started. I, that, that one ticked me off when they passed that law because my freshman year of college, we played poker every <laughs> single night, every <laughs> single night we were playing poker. Uh, one of my good friends is actually dealing cards in Vegas right now. Oh yeah. Uh, and yeah. And, oh God. I don't even remember. Uh, he's jumped around to a few different places. Um, but he was playing professionally for a while. And then, um, <laughs> he goes, he goes, dude, let me tell you, no 25 year old kid should ever have $35,000 $35, in cash in his hand because you do stupid, stupid things. Um, and he blew, he, he got really dumb for a while, blew a bunch of money and then had to start dealing. But I saw this kid, there were three of us one night, we went all in on a hand um, right after the turn. And um before we all flipped our cards over, he goes, I'm going to call out every single card you, you guys have. Dead on to the suit. Nailed him. Um, this, and, this is your buddy who ended up dealing. He's, that's who yeah, said this. <laughs> yeah. Well, he went, out, he went out to play for a while, and I asked him why, you know, why he quit. He goes, well, one, he told me the, the $35,000 story. Um, and then he goes, to be honest, you know, when the economy tanked, people were like, oh, I can get this cheap book and learn how to play poker. And he was like, all of a sudden, Vegas was flooded with people who had just read these books, and they were just making calls that were like, I, like, I couldn't risk the money because they're just doing crazy stuff. But, you know, he's like, the market got flooded, and I had to pull out for a little while because he just started losing too much. It's, um, it's, it's definitely not easy mentally to have a job where you can play really well and lose, and then play really well the next day and lose. And 
you string days and weeks together like that. And it's, uh, it takes a huge toll on your psyche. That's for sure. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, God, I think I put $25 in once online and felt awful because I lost $25. Um, yeah, you wake up the next morning and you're like a little bit sick. And you're like, did that, did that really happen last night? Ugh. A little a little bit, a little bit. Um, but I should feel that way when it comes to fantasy football because God knows I've not won anything. I almost, like, the last four games went, you know what, screw it. At least I'll get the last place trophy and have to, like, prominently put that on my mantle for a year. At least I'll win something. <laughs> uh, all right, so I did have a poker question for you. So now that we, we mentioned poker – um, so, and it's a fun question. So let me go there. So there's four people at the table. You're the first action after the blinds. You have pocket jacks. Um, and let's say you have half the chip stack of the leader. <laughs> I love this, by the way. I'm sorry. Is it, <laughs> is right. it a tournament or a cash game? Uh, tournament. All right. It's a tournament with a, with a big payout tournament with a decent payout. Okay. And we're down to like four people. There's four people at the table. You've got half the chip stack of the leader. And you get your cards and you got pocket jacks. Mm -hmm. All right. So you call the blinds. The next guy folds. So I would would raise. I wouldn't call. Okay. Touche. That's probably what you should do. Uh, (laughs) Well, let's say say the button's been raising a lot. And uh, and I call thinking he's going to raise. And then I'm going to re-raise him. But he folds. All right. We're going with that. Uh, So everyone checks up. They're like, I don't want to hear about poker. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I want to get to know the the mind of Mike McCanty, and I think this is a fun question. I love it. I love it. it. All right. So the blinds call, and it's you and two other guys. All right. The flop is a two of diamonds, a nine of hearts, and a king of spades. You have a jack of diamonds and a jack of spades. How do you play that hand? What's going through your mind as you develop that strategy? Um, so it's, it's a limped pot. So there's very little money in the pot here and there's an over card, neither like the small blind limp. So basically these two guys haven't really made any action other than not raise. So I assume they have, any two cards essentially and if one of those guys bets i would assume that he either paired up with the king or has two diamonds for a flush draw could potentially have a nine or is just bluffing to try to win a a a limped pot um and depending on how aggressive they've been they've been like taking stabs at these small pots that would determine how i react so if one of these guys bets, I would probably call. Um, if they both checked, I would bet, assuming that they're going to call with less than a king, like call with a pair of nines or maybe like pocket fives or ace high or something like that. Okay. So so there's a, you know, with, with poker, if you're really good at math – you can kind of guess the cards and where they are uh, on the board. So did like your accounting, like being an accountant, like did that help you like get even better at cards? Like were you able to no. count cards as illegal, but could you? So, so everything is done electron, like Microsoft Excel basically takes the role of all math. Okay. And the only math really needed for accounting is basic I don't even know what the word is. Addition, subtraction, multiplication, division. Like oh, arithmetic. You're never doing arithmetic, exactly. <laughs> Not like doing algebra or anything crazy. Um, whereas poker is statistics, or that's like the math element of poker is being able to calculate statistics, which is just something that I am uh, – I don't know if I'm born with it, but it's something genetic in me that just comes very naturally, like figuring out – percentages, pot odds, things like that. Um, so uh, accounting didn't really play a role in that now, unfortunately. Okay. That's a nice story. Like this job I hated really helped me to make money playing poker, but not <laughs> <laughs> Okay. So going back to a couple of, a couple of questions uh, f- from your blog posts. Um, so the one there, – there were a few that I read um, – from uh from back in february um because when i started the program i was like who is this who's this mike guy all right i'll look at on the regimen let's let's see who he is um 
And I have to say, one, I am really thankful for the whole thing you did on like weighing meat raw, because I never really like I think for the longest time I was weighing meat already cooked, mm -hmm. which means I was probably getting a lot more protein than I should have been getting. Yeah, yeah. Which is um, just expensive, right? That's the real downside there. Like it, it it is because I just I always assume that, oh, it's an eight ounce steak. So I order an eight ounce steak at a restaurant when they cook it, it's eight ounces, not mm -hmm. thinking that it's it's done raw. Um, so that one kind of really helped me, um, kind of better, uh, better my macronutrient, uh, marks. Good. Um, yeah. but the one I really enjoyed was when you're like, you know what? I can teach you how to drink a whole 12 pack of beer and still hit your macros. Cause I didn't understand how alcohol actually fit in. Um, so how does alcohol actually affect weight loss and muscle gain? Um, and how can we fit it into like maintenance macros? Because your, your post on that kind of made me go, holy crap, I can actually drink beer and not feel bad about it and hit my, hit my nutrition outlet? Yeah! yeah absolutely. Outlet, outlet. So I, I wrote a, I think it was like a four-part thing just because I, I couldn't get it all out in one, in one go. Um, and let's break this up into, is this like 22-year-old like Mike and Robbie at the bar getting... <laughs> out drunk together or is this like mature like and Robbie having like one or two glasses of wine or beer or a cocktail on, on a Wednesday night oh god 22 year old Robbie could drink until like 4 a.m. and wake up and not be hung over oh god the bachelor party I went to like a month ago I woke up went to the gym after I got back here I could not what? do anything hmm. I couldn't do anything I felt like crap and the next day had a hangover a hangover 48 hours later yeah, the two-day hangover is rough. That'll happen if you go hard at, at our old age. How old are you, by the way? Twenty. I'm 28, but my wife was like, oh, yeah, it only happens once you hit 30. And I'm like, you're lying to me because I got hit by it at 28. I <laughs> thought I had two more years, woman. Yeah, dude, I had a, a two-day hangover like three weeks ago, so don't feel bad about it. <laughs> <laughs> um, if, if we're talking about binge drinking, then there's a few things you have to realize. Like, First, you can make good decisions with alcohol by not drinking drinks that are um, that have a lot of calories derived from carbs or fat. So, if like a, a straight vodka, an ounce and a half of vodka is going to have 100 calories. But if you add eight ounces of Coke or fruit juice or anything like that, you're getting those extra carbs. So, eliminating any sugar or excess calories in your drink is is one thing you can do. Um, if you're, if we're going to get super drunk and have like eight or 10 or 12 drinks in one night, you're not going to hit your macros for the day. Like you, you can't, in, in theory, you bring carbs lower, you bring fats lower, and then you fill those calories with your drinks that night. But for most people, most normal size people, unless you have like 300 pounds of muscle and have the super high calorie maintenance. For most of us, we're just not going to be able to do that. So a fast following a night of intense drinking is one way to kind of offset that. Keep calories a little bit lower on Friday during the day. Binge drink Friday night. Keep calories a little bit lower on Saturday. You're, you're going to end up close um, calorically. Now, from a hormonal perspective, getting super drunk uh, temporarily decreases testosterone levels. It... In, it, it may or may not impair recovery. Like there are studies that show rats who get drunk. So drunk mice or drunk rats in these studies, like it impairs their muscle protein synthesis or ability to recover, which may or may not translate into humans. Um, but that's only if you're, you're drinking a ton. Now, if you want to have, if you're like four to six drinks a week, a couple glasses of wine for a couple nights a week, um, Really, what I would do is just keep carbohydrates and fat down by whatever, 200 or 250 calories during the day, keep protein where it is, and enjoy those two drinks at night. There's going to be minimal hormonal effect, um, probably non-existent effect on recovery. Just have some water after, rehydrate, uh, and, and you're going to be fine. All right. <clears throat> I, I, I've... I think alcohol is the one thing that everyone, most people, at least most people I know, when they, they start a workout regimen or, or they're, they're trying to lose weight, 
people are like, you know, I can I can eat less bread or I can eat some more broccoli, but I don't want to give up the booze. No. <laughs> um, and I feel like that's the hardest thing to kind of realize, though. I do think as you get older, you kind of realize, you know what? I think I'll eat the sweet potato instead of having the two margaritas because I won't wake up with a hangover from a sweet potato. Um, though I had a sweet potato beer and oh my God, it was amazing. Um, sweet potatoes are just amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so alcohol is one thing most Americans enjoy and no, we do not drink as much as the rest of the world. Um, which is surprising to me because we have so many, like there's so many stories about college kids and binge drinking and you see all the ads for beer. And yet somehow we don't even touch Europeans um, when it comes to ingesting alcohol. Um, but another thing that, that people struggle with every single day is sleep. Mm -hmm. And I know I brought this up, uh, you know, during uh, the 16 weeks program mm -hmm. um, is quantity versus quality. And you wrote a great article about, you know, breaking it down that, you know, it's better to get a quality sleep, like six hours of good hard sleep than eight hours of sleep. But that sort of flies in the in the face of, of what, you know, of what we're told. So did you learn that through personal experience or are there actual studies out there that kind of say, look, as long as you get a good hard sleep, you'll be fine? So here's where that came from. Um, growth hormone production happens in deep sleep. So you have REM, rapid eye movement sleep, and then stages one, two, three, and four. Stages three and four are deep sleep. Right. When, the, so when you first fall asleep, let's assume you're just out cold for six hours. The first time you go into deep sleep, because there's cycles, like every 90 minutes or whatever it is. Um, when you first go fall asleep, you're, deep, you're in deep sleep longer in that first cycle than in your second cycle, you're in deep sleep a little bit less and then a little bit less. So the point I was making is purely from a growth hormone production point of view, if you're waking up every hour and it keeps disrupting deep sleep, then you're actually spending more time in deep sleep if you sleep six straight hours than if you sleep eight or nine hours and wake up frequently. Um, so so that's what the, the quantity versus quality was. Now, obviously, if we could get and, and people are different. That's the other thing you have to understand. My roommate sleeps five or six hours, and I think he sleeps really well, but is completely productive and doesn't need a night to catch up and does really well at work and gets to the gym. And he runs marathons and does all these things. He's just like, he only needs five or six hours, sometimes less. I need eight hours of sleep, or not need. Like, I can get six for several nights in a row, but I'll, I'll be less on my game than if I had eight hours. So, from an anecdotal perspective, people are different. The, okay. I was just going to say the last point is um, is that regardless, I think pretty much everyone has worse. This this is for people whose goal is fat loss, because being in a calorie deficit is super difficult. People have worse adherence when they sleep less, which is partly just a factor of when you're in a deficit, you're often hungry. And if you're awake 18 hours versus 16 hours, those extra two hours at night are like super low willpower hours where you're more likely to snack on whatever, binge on whatever. Um, so more sleep is going to be helpful for adhering to wh whatever your, your calories or macros or whatever your diet is. Okay. Yeah. I, I think I try like an old man at 10 o'clock. I'm like, Oh, it's time to go to bed. Then there's a part of my brain that goes, stop being an 80 year old man. It's 10 o'clock. Um, but, uh, uh, well, here's the crazy thing. So my alarm is set for six. My body does one of two things in the summer. I have to keep the door shut. Um, because if sunlight barely peeks in and bounces off the wall and like hits a small piece of skin on my forehead, that's like, over the covers, like my body immediately goes up oh, time to get up. <laughs> but now I started to get up like half an hour, 45 minutes before my alarm goes off, which kind of pisses me off mentally because I'm like, damn it, body, you should sleep until the alarm goes off. Don't get up any earlier. I don't uh, know, man, getting up and feeling good before your alarm is, uh, 
it's much worse than the opposite, which would be your alarm goes off and you're completely stone dead and you need to snooze right. it. And don't feel good. Right. And, and I, so I started to kind of live by the, you know what? I'm going to listen to my body. If I get up at five 30, I'm going to get up, I'm going to do my morning routine, which I just start, have kind of started in the last two weeks. Um, I'm going to get up, I'm going to stretch, do a little yoga. I'm going to put my coffee on and then I'm going to sit down and, you know, do some reading for something, uh, like a, a fitness blog or, or someone else or, or some news. Well, actually I stay away from news cause it's depressing and the same thing every so two depressing. weeks. I hate the news. <laughs> It's awful. Sometimes I want like sometimes I want to go to other countries and be like, why is your, why why does our news suck? Like you guys have good stories. Like I, I ESPN. Like there are times I kind of have to like force my because I usually watch Sports Center in the mornings, but I haven't been lately. Um, but they're like my wish segment will literally start to make me cry. And I'm like, but this is so happy. It's so much better than <laughs> CNN or MSNBC or any of that other crap that just yeah. is fear mongering and, and whatever. Um, but your yeah. morning routine sounds awesome right now. I wish I could stick to something like this. Well, I, there was a guy on, uh, some friends of mine have a great, uh, podcast and guys that kind of inspired me, um, over at, uh, listen money matters. They had a guy on, his name was Hal Elrod and the dude died twice, like in a car accident, like the same accident, like dies twice within like 15 minutes of, of the, uh, of the, of the wreck. And he talks about, yeah. Do what? Yeah. Flatlines completely dead on the scene is dead at the hospital. They like, they bring him back and then he dies and then he comes back. Um, and his whole story was just very inspiring. And he wrote a book called like, um, the morning ritual or, or the morning, the mir miracle morning routine or, or ritual or something. And he talks about how he takes, he does, he takes an hour. So for 10 minutes, he does six things. Like he stretches, he does a little workout. Um, he takes 10 minutes in silence and just sits there and breathes. He does, uh, 10 minutes, of, of writing 10 minutes of something productive. Um, and then like 10 minutes of gratitude is what he practices. Mm -hmm. Um, and it just, it made me think, man, you know what? I actually could do some good in the morning, getting up and doing some stretching and, and, and doing some, uh, some reading or something. So I started to do that and it's, it's made the day a little better. Um, and, until I realized at seven 15, Oh crap, I actually got to go to work. I guess I should <laughs> dress now. Um, yeah, but you feel good. You you got things done. You, I think it sounds awesome. Yeah, it's 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 not bad. Um, it's 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 been good. Um, so a couple more here. So one of the articles that I really loved, um, you talked about internal versus external validation. Mm -hmm. And you know, with the new year coming up, a lot of people are going to be wanting to get in shape. They're going to make New Year's resolutions. Um, they're going to to make promises that this year, that 2015, will be different. And I think for America, we're so externally driven by, oh, the neighbors got a new car. Well, I guess they got a raise. I got to make more than Ted now because he got this Lexus and he probably bought that Lexus on, you know, a huge amount of credit and is going to, you know, but that's a whole different thing. <laughs> but we externally validate ourselves through so and much as opposed let, to, in, go ahead. Let me, let, let me interrupt super quickly. I like this. This it can't be just an American thing, by the way. Like, I I am as much. I think there are other amazing places in the world that um, might be progressing better, but like this this is a human thing, right? Yeah. Anyway, keep going, keep going. <laughs> <laughs> no, I no. I, well, I, the question is, you know. Um, you know, how do you, how do you nudge clients or anyone to start looking at happiness internally as opposed to externally? But you make a good point, Mike, that, you know, it, 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 it's not just an American thing. It's all over the world. I mean, look at people who stand in line for a brand new iPhone. And, and I, and I wrote a post on, on the website and I left it up, um, for, for side quest because I felt it kind of matters that, you know, I'm looking at these phones and I want to get a new phone and I'm obsessing over it, but it's just a phone. It just, do I need to be connected to the internet anymore? Like, can I just get a cheap phone? Why has it got to be this new shiny object? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And 
does it matter? It, it, it doesn't matter. What are other things that matter? And I don't think that Americans are the only ones that struggle with it. Um, unfortunately, my experience is only American. Yeah, um, yeah. But I, I think I think that's a yeah, good question. Is the iPhone 6 that much better than the iPhone 4 that you need to upgrade even though it's going to cost you X dollars, which is a meaningful amount of money? Um, yeah, I, I, I completely empathize with, with you. Yeah, yeah, I do. I do have to say that the bigger phone is kind of nice. Um, <laughs> um, it is. It no, is nice. If, if, if I'm trying to get a client in the right mindset, I I always start with why, and this often happens with my online coaching clients in the first, like the first time they have a slip up, which is often in the first six to 21 days, call it in the first, like they get through maybe the first Monday through Friday. And then sometime between then and like week three, um, there might be a slip up and they might feel bad and they might be second guessing the approach. And, um, they weighed themselves after their slip up and they're actually a pound heavier than when they started. As we know, scale weight can move three to 5% plus of body weight based on carbs and water. Um, but they're, they're thinking about throwing in the towel. They don't know if they really want it, et cetera. I always ask why, like, why do you want it? What, what do you want? Whether it's to lose weight, be stronger, feel better, be able to move, look better. But why do you want those things? Is it coming from a place of, I want to actually be able to hang out with my kids and not get tired. I don't want to die at 60. I want to, I want to live longer. Um, or is it, I want abs. So Jenny from class likes me because right now she likes this big jock guy. And if I only had this body, then I could be with this girl or then so-and-so person would, would think more highly of me. Because if, if the reasons are externally, if your motivation or validation is coming externally, it's it's fleeting. It's not going to last very long. So what? I mean, do you? So what? I guess my question is, how do you? What do you say to someone who who is so externally motivated? Because I don't think it, it, I, there are aspects where I think externally motivated is a good idea. You know, like you, you know, I like you know Arnold says. You know, he put all of these photos up of 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 those guys from those bodybuilding shows because he wanted to look like them. So you could say that's external because he's putting up, you know, a photo. It's like saying, I'm going to put up this mansion. I want to live in that mansion. Mm -hmm. um, but it's also internal, you know, as well, because it does provide internal motivation. So I, I guess, how do you, how do you kind of get someone to kind of work through the external to see the internal? Is there a way to do that? Um, so I, I, for Arnold, in that situation, I think that is more – it's coming from a place of inspiration more than a place of um, seeking approval, right? Right. Like those pictures are, are for that. Um, I mean it, it comes – so it comes down to the book that I recommend – that I used to recommend all the time, that I still recommend, but it's from 2013, which is aligning – aligning your personal values with the actions you take. Okay. Um, so rather than wanting something because, because you think other people will be impressed or because, um, you know, because it will get like this picture will get me more likes on this social media site um, to do it because it's part of, who you actually are and what you believe in. I don't know. Did, was was that? No, was that's clear? no, that's that's that actually that's a great answer. That you, if it's, you know, I, I'll be honest. There, there was a big part of me, and I think everyone struggles with this, especially in your teenage years, where, mm -hmm. you know, you're like, I want to look like this guy, or you know, I want to do this because I want someone. To, to love me for who I am and and, and you want that feeling of of, of, of mattering to someone um, and it, it took me a long time to kind of realize you know that I don't have to do this or that if I, 
to impress others. Impress others. Um, mm-hmm. uh, if, if I do it for me, I think I think that's something most people struggle with in their teenage years. Yeah. Hey guys, just a little break here. Had some technical difficulties here on the last few questions with Mike, so you will hear his answers, but my questions will sound a little different, as if they are not at the same time as the interview because I had to re-record them. Apologize for the issues, but the internet sometimes just wants to get a little funky. So who is your favorite hockey player of all time? Ooh, of all time. Mm-hmm. Um, Mario Lemieux. My dad My dad was actually – so my dad played goalie and, uh, and was at the Penguins rookie camp in 1985 with Lemieux and ended up like being the backup. And then when he got bumped down to, to the farm team, um, not playing, but I, I loved the penguins when I was really young and my mom always tells this story. She thinks it's hilarious. I don't know why I'm repeating it now. I like <laughs> it when she tells it, but when I was eight or whatever, the first time Lemieux retired, I had like a, a disposable camera and I was in front of our giant, like, you know, block TV, taking pictures of the TV of his last game because I was, and I was like crying and I was all depressed about it. Um, but yeah, Mario Lemieux. So you had a post uh, on your website about weighing food. Is there a shortcut that people can utilize if they don't have a scale with them to weigh food? Um, yeah, there, there are shortcuts, but like it's contextual, right? And it comes through practice. So a deck of cards of cooked meat is equal to about four ounces of raw meat. Vegetables that derive more than, say, a third of their calories from fiber. So broccoli, cauliflower, um, the, like the, f- the free veggies, the 12 to 15, spinach, things like that. Um, I wouldn't count. I guess that's kind of a, a little hack. Um other, other than that, I don't. I just estimate serving size and then Google it. So if it if it looks like about this much rice, like if it's about a cup of cooked rice, then I'll I'll punch that into Google and and see what it spits out or a tracker. I don't know. I'm old school. I like Google it and then I write it down or put it in a, a notepad. So Mike, you're a big fan of Ben and Jerry's. So double part question here. What flavor do they need to bring back from their graveyard? And what flavor is your favorite of all time? Okay. So what they need to bring back, they shouldn't even do limited editions because some aren't even that great and people would, like, they just wouldn't sell a ton of them and then they could remove them. Or they have limited editions like Scotchy Scotch Scotch, which was like had Will Ferrell on there. And after I think the new Anchorman was released, they brought it back for limited edition. That is amazing. They should bring that back. It's still probably not in like my top seven, but it's very good. Um, my favorite of all time is, so I like Cherry Garcia because it is, Cherry Garcia and Half Baked are diverse from a macro point of view because you can get Froyo or ice cream meaning you can use them on a training day or sometimes a rest day or a cheat day. But the best tasting are cinnamon buns and cheesecake brownie. So the next question I have to preface with a story. Uh, When I was on Roman's 16 Weeks to Sexiness program, someone brought up Star Wars. And Mike here had to unfortunately admit to Roman that he had never seen Star Wars. So Roman immediately told him to go watch them or his job was on the line. So I have to ask Mike, what was your favorite Star Wars film? This is so this is so embarrassing. You guys, you're going to hate me. <laughs> um, so I enjoyed I enjoyed the first one and during Empire Strikes Back I tried to watch it like four times and I could not get into it. I know it's like <laughs> you hate me so much right now. I don't know what to tell you, man. I don't know if it's like a, like the technology was too outdated by now and I, I couldn't get into it or what, but I literally tried to watch Empire Strikes Back and I couldn't. So, Mike, last question for you here. In a few of your posts, um, you talk a lot about death. And you even you know had a new post up a few days ago uh, where you talk about you know living to the max and, and how you thought about you know, going down on a plane that was you know, kind of going through some turbulence. 
So a lot of people may find that kind of morbid, but the thought of death is something that a lot of us do at some point in our lives think about. So I wanted to ask, why are you so fascinated with the thought of death and how does that motivate you? Um, so it, does, it doesn't intrigue me. It just, it just is on my mind. And um, I think by definition, thinking about death all of the time is morbid. Like if people were like, that's really morbid, I think I would just be like, yeah, I think it's the definition of, of the word. Um, but it's been something that I, that I thought about and was afraid of when I was younger, like dating back to probably being in like grade school. Um, and I never brought up to anyone. I never like talked about it because I thought it was weird and because I didn't know if other people thought about it and fear of judgment, yada, yada, et cetera. Um, living in my own head, whatever. But once I reframed it as this thing that w that happens to all of us and that no one ever talks about, um, but it's a certainty. And regardless of what you believe or your religion or anything, we don't know what's going to happen. Like no one knows for certain if there's an afterlife or like if it all just goes blank or if the soul rises up or da 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 like if you believe in Jesus or what like anything we don't know what happens when we die what we do know is that we get a certain limited unknown number of years to live and to affect other people and to do good things and to to have this thing called life and Wasting that, wasting any time is, it, it's like, the, in my opinion, the worst thing you can do, right? It's a huge gift. By being born, you, you won the lottery of, like, from a biological point of view. Um, and, uh, and yeah, so, so death motivates me to be absolutely me and be the best person that I can be and to positively impact other people as much as I can every single day. I've never talked about it. Like, I've, I mean, I've talked about it with buddies and stuff and like I have a memento mori, um, like counting down the, <laughs> this sounds so much, even to me, but like in my room, it's, uh, it's, it's like 52, it's a grid and it's 52 boxes across and 80 down and like you blacken out each box and that's one week of your life. And it kind of gives you perspective. Like this is how much time I have. And like, if I have, I mean, not really friends, but like if girls are ever in my room, they'll see it and be like, what is that? And then I tell them and they're just like, what the hell's wrong with you guy? Like, <laughs> it's a, uh, it's something on my mind. It's something that's important to me. And it's something that has made me a much better person. All right. I think that's a great place to kind of take the show out. So Mike, if people want to know more about Mike Vacanti, where can they find you online? If, if you Google my name, my website comes up first. It's called on the regimen, which, uh, which I'm starting to think is a pretty average name. And I might just go to <laughs> my name.com. But yeah, on the regimen or, or just Google. Again, I want to thank Mike for coming on the show. And listeners, please check him out. You can find him at ontheregimen.com. Links will be in the show notes as well. And you can find him on Instagram if you want to follow him there. Again, at on the regimen and Twitter at the same place. So Mike, again, I want to thank you for coming on the show. Thank you so, so much. Uh, he was voted one of the top five people in the fitness industry, taking it by storm by Fitocracy. So please, guys, check him out. He has a lot of great stuff and one of the best online fitness coaches that there is in the biz today. 